by 1954, a whole litany of busybodies had decided that, you know, we were okay sending our youth off to fight wars around the world, but we weren't okay with them reading any type of comic books with horror themes or the implication of sex. So, uh, yeah, that happened, and we find ourselves in 1956 with the heavy hand of the law telling us exactly what we are and aren't allowed to see in publication, but it actually ends up being somewhat of a coup for comic books, as in the long run, comic books ends up inventing a medium, the superhero genre, that still is the predominant seller to this day in the industry. You check the box office numbers, they sell movies like nobody's business. 1956 was sort of the first year of that the spawning of the superhero genre and again like i was saying forced by a heavy hand of the government saying that uh you know you you just you're corrupting the children out there the youth they can't grow without you planting these uh, horrific seeds in their mind and the, they're gonna go out and eat uh eat their dog or something some ridiculous stuff but that's where we are i'm cody we're big beaver comics uh, subscribe to this channel. Go over to BigBeaverComics.com and shop for a little bit of uh, comic books. You love comic books. That's probably why you're here. We're going to do these videos chronologically from 1956, the first year of the Silver Age, all the way up to modernity. That's right, to the present and maybe into the future. Who knows? Maybe I've got a crystal ball and we'll do some videos on the future. But as of right now, 1956, let's take a look at some of the highlights of the first year of what most people would consider the silver age of comic books. So we're going to see multiple publishers across this series. Early on, obviously, you're going to see the publishers coming out of the pre-code era. So you're going to see a little bit of EC Comics. You're also going to see DC Comics quite uh, prominently take their role for the first seven or eight years of this run from the mid-50s through to the early 60s. You're also going to see Atlas, which is the um, the precursor to what Marvel Comics is today. There's obviously a young Stan Lee, a young Steve Ditko, a younger Jack Kirby, all sorts of people working in the industry right now. Charlton Comics is out there. Uh, Dell Comics is out there. We're getting our first offs of a lot of Archie Comics. Those are out there. So the, the mid-50s does offer a lot of interesting variety, first appearances, origin stories, major collector issues. What we didn't add to this list was we didn't have any price. <clears throat> the prices kind of are scrambled all across the board. You could go out and do some price hunting for yourself because the grades vary so dramatically and with slight grade variations, prices can jump or fall very dramatically with stuff from print runs that are uh, basically MIA in the populace nowadays because stuff from 1956 just isn't really out there. So let's take a look. 1956, these are the heavy hitters the billboard top ones the uh the ones that uh that's shaped uh, a generation this was the burgeoning year the silver age Ooh, ah the fans gasp right here we go <laughs> mad magazine from ec comics uh we're, we're gonna do a little bit of mad and cry there'll be some stuff that falls in here as if it's a really interesting issue this obviously issue number 30 from november december 1956 first cover appearance of alfred e newman we all know alfred there on the cover he is a mainstay of mad magazine a face that uh, gen my generation and i would imagine a couple generations previous to mine would know in an instant he was all over mad magazine all over these covers which meant it was all over newsstands for 30 plus years everywhere you could find him uh was never in any kind of major movies none of that kind of stuff but alfred e newman is definitely pop culture classic stuff we move on to something a little more obscure published by atlas comics like i was saying the uh, precursor to marvel comics today this is the first appearance of yellow claw and jimmy woo i would imagine you do that just like rick flair would this is issue number one october of 1956 i personally would be lying to you if i told you i knew who the yellow claw was but i imagine 
he is phenomenal. I mean, take a look at that uh, house coat that he's out there in with that sweet kind of early advent of Doctor Strange collar. Uh, I would imagine that's yellow claw there. He looks like a like a badass, and I mean, he's ripping down what looks like a statue on a skyline in potentially New York there, or a building, like a skyscraper. He's got it. Uh, he's got it right around the throat there. So uh, yeah, he's taking that thing down like a like a cheap lot lizard, and uh, I would imagine Yellow Claw is a, is a phenomenal character, but I don't know too much about him. More characters I don't know too much about: Sugar and Spike. This is their origin and first appearance. Sugar and Spike, the first issue from April and May 1956, published by DC Comics. This uh, looks like a couple of kids playing. Uh, kid stuff maybe these are just like kind of dennis the menace little roughhousers sugar and spike kind of like sugar and spice maybe except uh maybe spike's a little rambunctious one or something you're getting into all sorts of the the kerfuffles out there i'm, I'm not entirely sure but uh as far as as far as ebay and the uh sellability is concerned that's an issue that a lot of people out there are looking out for let's take a look at something else a little more obscure a little more of the time but uh, not someone you would expect to be involved in its story by Stan Lee here, Sherry the Showgirl. Issue number one from July of 56, also published by Atlas Comics. Again, the precursor to Marvel. Sherry, uh, Sherry's showing a little bit of leg. Sherry looks nice. I mean, I wouldn't kick Sherry out. We'd hang out. Me and Sherry could get to know each other. I mean, I don't want to know your last name or your whole big life story or anything. Like, keep the Uber running, Sherry. But, like, sh Sherry's a cute girl. Sherry looks like she could roll. Stan Lee was probably thinking the same thing when he was writing that story. That's a young Stan Lee. I would imagine young and spry Stan Lee probably has a thing or two to say or about the old-fashioned. Uh, <laughs> if, if I was a betting man. I put this in here because this is obviously the uh, the, the Black Knight that we kind of know and love from Marvel Comics, but I just thought this cover was just so awesome. So I figured I'd just jump on this, throw it in here. Number five of the Black Knight run from Atlas Comics. Uh, this is April 1956. This is the last issue, and I just, just thought it was a cool guy. I am a comic fan at the end of the day. I might uh, talk like a jackass, and we might do all sorts of business and stuff like that, but uh, this all popped off because I'm a comic book goofy too, so I see this kind of stuff and I'm like, look at that cover. That's so cool. I want it. <laughs> so Black Knight number five. It's so cool. I want it. Um, here's a here's a, a run of comics we're going to see quite a bit in the mid to late 50s as we pop off the silver age of comic books. Showcase has an inordinate amount of superhero first appearances, origin rewrites, um, all sorts of like uh, appearance shuffling around from the golden age to the silver age, the way a character looks. This isn't one of them, but I would imagine this is still a fairly sought after book just because it is number one in the series, showcase number one, March, April, 1956, first appearance of Fireman Farrell. Um, I don't know much about Fireman Farrell, and I would uh, dare you to find many people that do. Published by DC, Fireman Farrell looks like he's not following proper occupational health and safety standards, coming down that ladder, not using any hands, the little weight shifts. We're probably going to lose Mr. Farrell, and maybe that's where he went. And uh, this poor victim, maybe he's throwing that guy, he's not following any rules. Maybe he's like throwing this guy back in the fire. I don't know that doesn't it doesn't seem safe he doesn't seem like he's following a lot of the the proper procedures i'm not too sure what things were like in 56 but i think they were still trying to like keep the stats low as far as like your saves and losses when it came to being a fireman but uh what do i know i don't know you might live in some weird dystopian world where uh where they're not keeping score about that kind of stuff but showcase like i said definitely one of those series we're gonna see a lot of one more in 56 issue number four a big one big money in good grades in mid grades and any grades big big money first appearance and origin silver age flash barry allen 
beautiful stuff, just iconic. There's not a whole lot that needs to be said about the book or about the character, about that costume, about the colors in 1956 that we got on a lot of these DC books, where it's just a classic superpowers, superhero look of DC that just makes DC so timeless. Uh, I don't find Flash to be one of those characters that translates really well to the movie theater. I don't know if that's just me. I don't know if we can really interpret moving at like the speed of light really well. And it just doesn't make for a great experience. But the actual character of Flash, I love the character of Flash. This Barry Allen one especially is one of my favorites. We will see more showcase. I can assure you of that in the uh, coming years as we look into uh, the, the rest of the 50s. We've got two more runs of books, a couple of issues from both series, another series we're going to see a whole lot of, and probably the one that a lot of you guys are the most familiar with. We're going to start it off with Detective Comics 230, April 56, first appearance of the Mad Hatter classic uh colors classic like i said 1950s dc aesthetic it's not the most busy um cover a lot of hats if if you like hats to cover your head for all sorts of seasons you know if it's raining or if it's windy or if is that a one with a buckle on it, if you want to be a leprechaun or the or hats you know just if you want a hat but he's mad Hatter's not the most interesting villain so he doesn't really make this cover unfortunately pop but it is his first appearance so pretty sought after book but hats right let's move on to a cover that is the best cover on the list it's not even up for debate detective comics 233 one of the greatest covers i've ever seen in my life origin and first appearance of batwoman kathy kane publisher obviously dc comics look at that batmobile with the bat head on the hood and the colors on Batwoman and just the classic aesthetic and the bat signal, it's it's just perfect, isn't it? Isn't it just perfect? I'm oh that's I don't have anything that I can add to that because anything I say just removes from how phenomenal that is. I don't have an issue of that. I want that so bad. That's so nice. Let's move along. Origin of Batman and his costume in this issue of Detective Comics 235 from September of 56. I also believe uh, Thomas Wayne, father of Bruce Wayne, is uh, Batman there on the cover, which would also make that somewhat of a first appearance in this um, reimagining of the Batman story as Thomas Wayne is Batman. That uh, brings an end to the Detective Comics. One more nice little rip with Batman still at the head of the class. Batman now, the other run of Batman comics, was going strong in the 50s too. Was it issue number 97, February of 1956? You get the second appearance of the Bat Hound, who's a good boy. Who's a good, still the classic DC aesthetic from the 50s. It all just looks so damn good. All the colors are amazing. He's a good boy. I don't know if the dog should be doing science like that. I don't even think Batman and the Robin are like equipped to be mixing all this. What are they making meth? What's going on there? I don't even know what's going on. You guys, look, man, if you guys are liking this, subscribe to the channel. Go check us out, BigBeaverComics.com. Uh, here on YouTube, go check out our wrestling documentary channel, Carney, C-A-R-N-Y. We'd love to have you go check that out. Let us know how we're doing. And stay tuned. We're going to drop a whole bunch more of these. Let's round out the last couple Batman covers. Beautiful aesthetic. Last appearance of Golden Age Penguin in this book, Batman 99, April of 56. Uh, you're like I was saying, we're going to see a lot of ending of Golden Age, whether it's aesthetics, whether it's the characters as a whole, uh, whether it's origin stories and seeing a complete new unveiling of a lot of these DC characters in the Silver Age, having new names, new backstories, uh, new powers, new looks to them. So we're going to see that quite a bit. This is obviously that uh, unwinding of the Golden Age still last appearance of the Golden Age penguin i love the aesthetic it's awesome i know i just keep saying that batman 100 june of 56 an anniversary issue looking back on some of the more classic covers at the time at the the time 100 was published in 56 that's a long time ago uh you see batman number one there a lot of the other 
earlier covers that are very, very classic to the Batman run. And we will finish this list off, this list of 1956. I've been Cody, here with Big Beaver Comics, Batman 101, August of 56, with my man, not the man, not the phone booth man, not the caped man. He didn't do the whole save the world man of steel faster than a he just showed up like a just mild-mannered reporter here to just take a peek hang out with batman for a spell clark kent slides in like a mac in the last issue that we're looking at in 56 we'll be back for 57 i've been cody you've been you subscribe to the channel and make sure you stay cool out there eh? peace